Hi everybody, I'm Jenny. Welcome to our live show here. I'm with Steve Canino. How are you? Hi Jen, how are you? I said your name right? Yes, you did. Okay, perfect. He's with Coachella Valley Recovery Center. He's the owner. Yes, Yes, you and your wife, right? Yes, Okay, amazing center, you guys. I cannot wait for you to explain everything about your program. But before we get into that, first, thank you so much for being here. Thank you um, for having me. I don't know you that well, but what I do know, you uh, are so passionate about what you do, about recovery, about 12 step, sponsoring people, and just these success stories of people that you sponsor and just the community and, and how you're respected. So thank you for everything you do in the community and the people that you help. Um, more people need to be stepping up and being of service and doing these things. So thank you, first and for- thank foremost. You. Um, but yeah, let's please get into how you found your way to recovery. You know, you're in recovery. How long do you have? Absolutely. Um, so again, thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. Um, I am in my fifth year. Uh, okay. I just celebrated four years in September this time around. And I yeah. say this time around, it's not my first time. And it's good for people to know that because Absolutely. there's still this stigma and shame around relapse coming back, you know, coming back into the rooms and we need to get rid of that. Absolutely. Because unfortunately it is what it is. Relapse is a part of this disease, you know, and more people need to talk openly about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it is a part of the disease and it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. So if you're new and, and, and you haven't relapsed, don't think that you have to relapse to get this, right. but it's a part of it. And yeah. if it's a part of it, don't be afraid or ashamed to come back and, and raise your hand because uh, there's an old saying, I don't really love it, but it's true. We don't shoot our wounded. When we come back to the rooms of exactly. recovery, we've been run through the mill again. And yeah. it's uh, it's happened to me numerous times. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'll, I'll just share a little bit that um, I went to my first meeting in 1980 and I celebrated one year sober in 1981. Wow. And uh, as you heard, I just celebrated four years in September. So the disease is alive and well, if that's what you want to participate in, or if you don't make the effort to stay away from active addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, But I like to call myself a recovered alcoholic because when it was brought to me this time around, my sponsor introduced me to the 12 steps, the way that they are in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. And um, and I'm going to talk a lot about AA and no, the 12 steps. Yeah. And that's that's what my, my, my facility is based on. That's mm-hmm. what my life and my recovery is based on. It has a lot of God in it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's what got me to where I'm at today. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, when I came back this time and I got sober, I worked the steps exactly how they're laid out in the, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and doing so I found and was able to concede to myself that I was an alcoholic rather than just admit it. Mm. And that's the big difference in my recovery today. Right. Can you repeat that one more time? For yeah, people I'm listening? able to concede and, mm-hmm. I, and I'll explain where that's at okay. so that your viewers can, can take a look. And it's, mm-hmm. it's really important. I never yeah. saw it before, and I read the so book a hundred times. Yeah. But I never saw this before. So on page 30 in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, at the very bottom, it says, we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. Mm-hmm. This is the first step in recovery. Mm-hmm. So when Bill Wilson wrote the book, he knew that the first step wasn't the first step, number one. The first step was conceding you were an alcoholic. Because until you concede that you're an alcoholic, you can't achieve the ability to admit and and surrender. Right. I have to I can't surrender from something that I don't admit that I have or that I am not willing to accept that I have. Mm-hmm. And all it concede means is is stop resisting something that's factual. Right. And so that's what changed my life this okay. time. Uh, and then of course the continued working of steps 10, 11 and 12. Right. But a little of my background, I grew up in a really good neighborhood. Uh, I, my father worked hard. My mom was uh, a dog handler and dog judge for the AKC, American Kennel Club. She would travel and had a good life, had a good school life. My first choice of, of drugs was food. And I was a, I wouldn't call myself a member of OA or needing to be in OA. Not that that's a bad thing, but I just overate. I, I ate. And I ate and I ate and never felt 
that it was a big deal. People would make fun of me. I would laugh at them making fun of me so that I was the one in control of that insanity. Mm-hmm. Always wanted to be in control. Right. And, you know, I never had a God in my life, not because I didn't believe in God, but because I was never introduced my dad was just, he was a recovering Catholic and, <laughs> you know, an altar boy and just didn't, you know, bring it to us. Mm-hmm. So fast forward in high school, I had that, you know, um, what, uh, what I want to say, all the girls liked me. I was the friend. Okay. I was the guy that was always the friend. You know, okay. it's like, hey, you want to go out? You are my friend. I really like having you as my friend. And it was like, it was hard for me. So... Mm-hmm. I found cocaine and alcohol. I found alcohol and I could drink more than anybody. And then I found cocaine and I could drink more than anybody and I didn't eat. So I lost the weight. So the drugs kind of worked in the beginning. Right. Got me to where I thought I wanted to be. But then I found I couldn't stop. Hmm. And I didn't understand that that was alcoholism at the time. Um, But I couldn't stop. And when I did stop, it was for brief intervals. Mm-hmm. And then I would always go back to where I was before using and drinking at least the same amount, if not more. Mm-hmm. And then it, financially, I got in a position to where I could do what I wanted to do as much as I wanted to do. And I found other ways of using drugs, um, you know, I, uh, freebasing and so forth. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, got married uh, to my first wife and had my first child and still couldn't stop and uh, would do, you know, some horrific not physical things to either one of them, but I would do some horrific things as, as an alcoholic and I had no control over it. Mm -hmm. Um, I would buy the baby's diapers and then start using and then go back and return the diapers for the money so that I could have more money to use. And I'm saying this so that everybody that's done that, because you know there's a lot out there that won't tell you. And I wear mine on my sleeve because it's the only thing that keeps me sober today is not being afraid to tell you what I did. And people need to hear that. And it gives me goosebumps with just you saying that because, again, just like, you know, people coming back into the rooms, uh, people relapsing, you know, there's the shame. People don't want to talk about it. But in order to heal... We need to be honest and open about what we did, you know, and the experience. And so someone else can relate and go, oh, you know, I, I'm not the only one. I don't okay. have to live with this heaviness of things that I did in my addiction. Absolutely. So I, I had, I got, I'd already been introduced to AA in 1980 before mm-hmm. all this started happening. And, and I knew that Alcoholics Anonymous was there. And I still didn't know I was an alcoholic. I still couldn't recognize and identify that even though I had celebrated time. Mm. You know, it was just like it lost. uh, It was lost. It was gone. I had blocked it out almost like a blackout to recovery. Mm -hmm. But something deep down inside remembered what had been planted in the very beginning. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I could go through a whole long dissertation as to what happened with me. The bottom line is it's the same thing that happens to everybody. I believe that's that's an that that's inactive addiction and and alcoholism and that is is that i lost everything i lost my soul i lost my life i lost my freedom uh and when i say lost my life i lost my 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 ability to be with my child ability to be with my wife at the time she was an active alcoholic as well um and so i ended up not being able to show up for work so i started committing crimes Mm -hmm. and the crimes I committed were petty because I never wanted to hurt anybody. I wasn't a bad person inside. Right. So I would like go into a store and fake that I had a gun in my thing. I wouldn't carry a gun. I'd fake it. Mm-hmm. And I'd steal money and I'd get caught and I'd get busted. And they would take the fact that I faked it and they would call it a simulated. And they would give me a strike and a strike. So in, 2000, or in 1994... I was facing 25 to life in the penitentiary, having never been in prison before. Wow. All behind my drug addiction and alcoholism. Mm. Never having had a weapon. What had happened was I went in and I boosted three bottles of liquor from a store. Security guard grabbed me from behind. I twisted free. He broke his finger. There's a certain kind of robbery that takes you from a petty theft to a robbery when something like that happens. Um, So I'm sitting in jail wondering how I got here. Mm. You know, I come from a good home. 
my parents paid their bills. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it, it's just, there's just no reason why I got there except for the reason that I would find later when doing the, the things that we need to do to find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is, I found that I suffer from a spiritual malady. And once I ingest drugs or alcohol, my ability to stop goes out the window. What did that feel like when you finally had that realization? It was it was freeing. Mm. It, it wasn't even scary. It was the other side of scary. It was so freeing to know that. And that was the day that I conceded rather than admit it. Because, see, I can surrender today and take it back tomorrow. I can admit and tell you I was joking right, right. here to your face. <laughs> but if I concede that I'm an alcoholic, then... I'm in acceptance of it. And there's no more what ifs. Mm -hmm. I like to say I used to be a member of the what if club. Now I'm a member of the no matter what club. That's right. So I'm married to a lovely lady. If she leaves tomorrow, I would be sad, but I wouldn't get loaded behind it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have beautiful grandkids. And if something tragic happened, you know, God forbid, I wouldn't drink or use behind it because that's not what makes me an alcoholic. What makes me an alcoholic is that if I leave God, my God that I believe in, and um, and and I try to run it myself, then then I'm susceptible to the disease. Mm -hmm. But it says in our literature, no human power could relieve us from our alcoholism. God couldn't. What if He were sought? And I believe that. So if I continue to see see God and and do the work necessary, help others then there's no stopping me from staying right. sober. So what do you tell your sponsees um, when they're struggling with God and finding that spiritual component? Because you hear that a lot, I right? love that. I so love that question. What, what, it, what do you say? So simple. And my, my sponsor made it so simple for me. It's like, okay, so I have a blue shirt on. You have a black shirt on. They're both shirts, right? So your conception of God, if you don't have a conception of God, just... Use the word. It's not going to hurt. It's three letters. Right. If those three letters stop you from not dying and you say those three letters time and time again and somehow, way, shape, or form, you put it out there, you'll eventually start believing it because Absolutely. you'll see that it's working and you'll know that there's no other thing that, that it could be. Mm -hmm. Why stop us from believing we both have shirts on? You know, right. No, mine's a black shirt. No, mine's a blue <laughs> shirt. Well, who cares? It's yeah. shirt. Right. You know, and I use that. It's such a stupid um, kindergarten explanation that he used with me. But that's what I needed to hear. Uh -huh. So I'll, I and, and I won't use any names, but I will give you an example. I have a sponsee who in the beginning, when I started working with him, felt that way. He's like, I don't have a God. And I said, well, OK, do you have a problem saying the word God? And he mm -hmm. said, yeah, kind of. And I said, mm -hmm. well, I said, you know, then maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you need to get somebody else as a sponsor. He goes, no, I want you to sponsor me. I said, okay, then do me a favor. Use that word, the three letter word. Just say it. Just say it, man. You don't want to die, right? No. I said, just say that three letter word. He started saying it. Now he calls me and he goes, man, I was praying to God on my way down here. And it's like he found that God eventually. Yeah. Because here's the thing. It's hard to find anything positive in the beginning of your recovery because you're sure. detoxing and you're losing your best friend mm -hmm. and you're walking away from the only thing that you knew as a security blanket mm -hmm. and you're being asked to replace it with a group of people sitting in a room that are talking about their problems. You know, if you get into the mental health side of it, you're sitting with therapists who are telling you what your problems are. Mm -hmm. And you're being asked to find this three-letter word and start trusting and putting everything in his hand. And it's, it's, it's scary. It's scary. Mm -hmm. But if you simplify it, and Dr. Bob wrote it on a prescription pad in 1938, mm -hmm. and it holds true. Trust God, clean house, and help others. That's all we have to do. But if we don't do that, we have no chance. Right. Is basically what he said. Mm -hmm. So you give me the prescription... If I take the prescription, I got a chance. If you don't take the prescription, our chances are less than average. Right. And how about give it a try? And if it doesn't work out, you can always go Let back me know. to what you were doing before. Exactly. And if I'm you not know? your sponsor, if I'm not the guy that works out for you, use somebody else. Mm -hmm. If you want a, a guy that has a... And people who don't believe in God do get sober, but they also... I guarantee you, if you really 
dug deep, they believe in something greater than themselves. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I choose to call God, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. That's what I believe. You don't have to believe that, but mm-hmm. you, but don't knock me for believing it. Mm-hmm. You know, just like I don't knock you for believing in, you know, whatever. Yeah. Just know that something greater than you is what's necessary because you cannot fix the problem with the same mind that created it. Absolutely. You can't not. do it. No. Yeah. I couldn't. Yeah, and and nobody can. There's yeah. there's no way. Um, what for you over the last year, the four the last four years, four and a half years, um, has really helped you stay sober? I mean, of course we have the program, but like, what in your daily life, like, what things would you suggest that really made it different this time for you than before? That's a great question. Steps ten, eleven, and twelve. Mm-hmm. It's the answer. And for people that don't know what that is, can you explain those steps? Step 10 is taking a daily inventory and when wrong, promptly admitting it. Step 11 is seeking God through prayer and meditation. And if you if you really read the book and you see the way that, that those two steps are differentiated, a lot of people think at night they're doing a 10th step when they sit down and they write. And they're not. They're doing an 11th step. Because in the 11th step, it asks you to ask yourself 10 questions. Where was I wrong? Or was I selfish, dishonest? resentful or in fear and uh, what could I have done better mm-hmm. um, uh, did I keep something from somebody did I own amends um, it asks you and and I, off the top of my head I, I know it when I'm sitting down doing it but um, did I add anything to the stream of life today um, what did I do to help somebody today it asks you to ask 10 questions and write about them Mm-hmm. It says that night before we retire, mm-hmm. we turn to God and we ask him and then we ask him in prayer and meditation to remove that. That saved my life. I don't ever wake up the next morning with the same issues that I had the day before because I dump them on God's table at night when I write and I can I should have brought them. I have in four and a half years, I have t- 10 journals with just the answers yes 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 no 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 yes okay i sponsored i walked this person through the step i did that every single day i don't miss a day haven't missed a day if i go on vacation and i forget my book we were in vegas last week i forgot my book i took the hotel stationery and i asked myself the 10 questions and i wrote it out Hmm. and people say well you can miss a day i said who told you you can miss a day doesn't say miss a day in the book. You didn't miss a day in your addiction. Exactly. Right. Well, my sponsor, I asked him that. I said, can I miss, what if I don't, can I miss a day? He goes, I don't know. I go, what do you mean you don't know? You're my sponsor. He says, I have never missed a day. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he says, and it's worked for me. So maybe you might want to try not missing a day. Yeah. And you know what? I always say that if, if the world did the steps, especially those last ones, what a better place it would be just to have that self-awareness, just to have that forgiveness, just to be able to, um, you know, be in a place of forgiveness, be of service, I mean, just everything, everything it is we need in our lives. So doing it every day, there's there's nothing but positive that would come from that. Absolutely. And then step 12, of course, carrying, right. carrying the message mm-hmm. wh- wherever possible. It's always possible mm-hmm. for me because yeah. I plug myself in. I go to meetings, I raise my hand as a sponsor, I talk to newcomers, I give them my number, and I get there and I call them. That's the difference. A lot of people in AA, and I'm calling those people out right now on your podcast, the people in AA that that talk about get numbers, give your number, blah, and then you don't call the person the next day. You're not doing justice to mm-hmm. the program or yourself or the newcomer. Program of recovery is about keeping commitments and being honest. Mm -hmm. And those are the two things that I had a hard time with as an alcoholic. I would lie to you. I would tell you I was a race car driver and never been in anything but a Volkswagen. You know, (laughs) I would tell you I was an airplane pilot and never been. I'm afraid to fly. Yeah. (laughs) You know, And, and, and I would make you believe it. Yeah. So. The thing is, is if I get a newcomer's phone number and I tell him I'm going to call him, I call him the next day and say, hey, this is Steve. I'm reaching out. Mm -hmm. I met you at the blah, blah, blah meeting the other night. Just want to call and say hi and see how you're doing today. And they go, wow, I never thought you would call. And actually call. And actually physically call, not just text. Yeah, Yeah. no, 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 no. I I don't text. Because a lot of the younger generation. I do not text with my sponsees. You need to know that. I'm going to say that right now. That is not communication. Bill Wilson, even though there was no texting, he didn't say write me a letter and send it. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what texting is yeah i want to hear your voice yeah i want to hear who you, how you're doing i can tell in your voice if you're scared mm-hmm. i can tell in your voice if you're if you're loaded mm-hmm. 
for the most part. I might yeah. be wrong 1% of the time, but if, if I'm talking to you, I can say, well, what's really going on with you mm -hmm. right now? You know, I can't tell in a text no, what's really can't. going on with yeah. you. Um, couple, I want to ask you a couple questions. 100%. Okay. Um, a couple fun ones and then some serious ones. The first question is, for people coming in, coming into AA, um, the younger generation, maybe even some of the older, older people, what, do you, what would you say about boundaries um, and uh, like balance in that space? Ba boundaries as far as? Like, I hear it a lot, you know, um, where a, with a lot of the younger generation, they come in and they get so close with some people that, you know, someone, someone dies or, you know, there's families that get involved and just like the privacy and confidentiality of being in AA and different things like that. Like, is there good boundaries for people to hold, you know, etiquette? Like if you're new to coming into the rooms of AA, like, is there anything that you would suggest for people out there, um, just for them to protect their own space while they're new in the program. Yeah, never, never, never. I, I think I understand what you're asking me. Never talk about anybody else that, that you've heard. No, never talk directly about anybody else's story as far as like, don't go, hey, Steve said this in the meeting the other day and blah, blah, blah. Don't do that if you're in an AA meeting. The anonymity is extremely important. Right. But never be afraid to wear your own recovery on your sleeve because Absolutely. if you don't, nobody will know. Like I will sit at a restaurant and for the newcomers, I'll go into a restaurant and sit down and the waitress will say, you know, do you need the beer and wine menu? I said, no, I don't drink. Yeah, you know, too. <laughs> And I don't say, no, I don't drink. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an AA. But if she goes, oh, you don't drink? I say, no, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an AA. I say that because she might be struggling. Right. Or she might have a family member that's struggling, right? Yeah. Have yeah. you ever had that happen? I've had somebody Absolutely, say, really? I have. And I'll give them my business card and yeah. say, look, mm -hmm. if you need help for fun and for free, if you want to just call me, not to call me and come to my facility, but if you want to just call me and tell me that you have a, a brother and put him in touch with me. And I've done that. I had a, I had a woman that cleaned my house. Mm. You know, and she no longer works for me and there's no name being mentioned, but she talked to me about her son who had a very bad problem and I gave her my number and she called me and talked mm -hmm. to me about it and it made her feel better and I was able to help somebody that yeah. day. You know, so that bound, that that's the kind of boundaries I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, and that's a perfect answer. Um, because I think that's what happens sometimes. People go and they talk, especially the youngsters, and it's like, okay, respect the rooms, right? Absolutely. But when you're out there, be be true to who you are because you never know who you're going to help along the way. Um, what do you think you've learned the most about yourself through this process? That I was born to help other people. That that my passion isn't about making money. My passion isn't about uh, being on podcasts or being successful in that respect. And I do enjoy that. And I think that this is a great platform and I, I commend you doing this, but my passion is helping people. And if I could reach more people because of your podcast, then my passion gets ignited, mm -hmm. you know, and, and everything that I do gets lit on fire mm -hmm. in a good way. Like, like, Oh my God, the whole place is buzzing because he said work steps 10, 11 and 12, right. Exactly. you know, Oh, I found the answer. It doesn't have to be the God, the God that every, yeah. if they hear what I'm saying Those right seeds now that you're planting. Yeah. yeah. And you plant them all day long with how you talk. So that's what I want to do. That's yeah. what I want to do. And you know, if, if you want to, if you want to work 12 to 15 hours a day and in the beginning, make no money, open a treatment center. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. I mean, it's the truth. Yeah. I'm working around the, I'm working harder than I ever worked. Mm -hmm. And it's just so that I can give back you know, uh, different type of work, different type different of work, different type of work. This is real passionate work. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. What did you struggle with the most this time around in recovery? What was one thing you really had to work on? Honestly, nothing. Okay. <laughs> this time around, it was so simple. Mm -hmm. My sponsor, God bless him. His name is David F. Right on David. And he <laughs> is, um, amazing mm -hmm. um i struggled with nothing um yeah nothing okay. 
Really, it yeah. just it just fell into place the way that he presented it, mm -hmm. and it's the way that I present it to my sponsees. And we have a, a sponsorship family group mm -hmm. of about three hundred people nationwide. Wow! From Florida to California, and um, I honestly I would say ninety five percent of them stay sober for long term right. sobriety. I would say wow. there's probably only about a 5% relapse ratio on, on 300, 400 people. And we all work the steps the same way. And here's the beauty behind it. Mm -hmm. We guide our sponsees through the steps and we have them do it. everything that we do. We give them a step journal and they fill it out like the fear prayer and this is next and this is next and this is next and this is next. So that they have a guide to sponsor their guys with, which is directly out of the book. It's everything we do is out of the book. Mm -hmm. No opinion. There are no opinions whatsoever included in the way we work the mm -hmm. steps. It's all 100% out of the book. Mm -hmm. Anything I tell you that you read on the paper, you can go back into the book and coincide, mm -hmm. and, and it coincides with you. So, if I get ready to do a 10th step and I can't get a hold of my sponsor, which is her first person I call when I need to do a 10th step, I call and I say, David, if it's a voicemail, I say, hey, David, it's Steve. I need to do a 10th step. You know what? You don't have to call me back. I'm going to call another alcoholic. Thanks. Boom. And I'll call another alcoholic from my family group. And when I finally eventually reach them, they will take me through the 10th step process the same way that my sponsor would have done it mm -hmm. because that's how they learned it. So there's never any confusion. Got so it's it. simplified. Yeah. Simplified. There's one way to do it. The way that it's in the book, do it. Right. Have somebody do guide you. Do it that you. way. Right. That's because, it. and that was going to be my last question um, before we move on to your, your business, um, is that, you know, if someone's, first of all, if they don't know anything about AA, they're brand new, they're just sober, they're scared to ask, or let's say they've gone to a meeting or two and they haven't hit it off, like it hasn't been for them. Um, what would you suggest for those people? Find the right person. You know, sponsorship is, is is not only personally what you feel, but it's what you see them doing, portraying themselves when they're in a meeting. Very important. You know? Yeah. Um, I say get a sponsor right away, but if you're in a meeting and you hear somebody talking about them, 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 or certain things, it just, I, I mean, for me, yeah. I... I needed somebody that just was going to get, wasn't going to, no nonsense. Yeah, no BS. Yeah, I didn't That's what need you somebody petting me mm -hmm. while I went through the process. I needed right. to work. Yeah. I needed to stop drinking. Right. I needed to stop smoking crack. Right. I didn't need a friend. No, you need. And my sponsor, <laughs> let me tell you the first thing my sponsor said to me. And, and I say this to every single one of my sponsors. I sponsor about seven guys and they're all still sober. Not a one of them has relapsed. They're all doing the deal yeah so my sponsor said okay first thing i'm going to ask you is do you want what i have the second thing i'm going to ask you are you willing to go to any length to get it mm -hmm. and he said i asked you that question i'm gonna hang up the phone you call me back and tell me boom and he hung up on me and i'm like i'm shaking i'm about a day so half a day sober, uh -huh. just white knuckling it. yeah I said, yes you know what hung up on me call him back i said hey you hung up on me and he goes, so you have the answer? And I said, yeah, I want what you have. And he goes, are you willing to go to any length to get it? And what I mean by that is any length, whatever I tell you. Now, I'm never going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do, but are you willing to do whatever I ask you to mm -hmm. do? And I said, absolutely. He said, yeah. okay, great. Read the first 64 pages, not the first 164, the first 64 pages of the big book. Call me every day, go to a meeting every day, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. He goes, have a pad of paper ready when you call me tomorrow. I said, okay. He said, oh, and by the way, he says, when we're done with this process, we might not be friends. <laughs> and he says, that's not what I'm here for. I'm uh -huh. here to save your life. Right. <laughs> he says, at the end of this, we might not be friends, but you will know how to walk another man through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to save their life. That's right. He says, but... We'll see how that turns out. Well, mm -hmm. he's my best friend. Yeah. You know, and all of my sponsees, I tell them the same thing and we're best friends. Yeah. So the reason I say that is because if you find a guy that's no nonsense like that, that's there to save your life and not be your marriage counselor or your financial advisor or your, exactly. your, no, your, your direct, your, your travel coordinator. Right. If you find a guy that just wants to walk you through the 12 steps as a guide, 
You know, um, I wouldn't hike the Andes Mountains without somebody by my side to show me which way to go. Exactly. You know, uh, I wouldn't jump out of an airplane if I hadn't taken a lesson from somebody mm -hmm. who knew what to do. Right. But why would I want to take my life into my own hands in recovery and not find somebody that was there to show me how to stay sober, mm -hmm. not to do all those other things? That's what I would tell you to look for, okay. that person. Yeah. That person, man, woman, doesn't matter. We have people in our sponsorship family, men that sponsor women, women that sponsor men. Mm -hmm. It's whoever knows and has a working concept of the 12 steps out of the big book, the way it was written. Okay, so anyone out there listening that's struggling, that's what you need to hear right there. That's what I yeah, say. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, and let's get into your, your business. Please share with everybody what you do, what you're passionate about, um, how you guys started this. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the name of my company is Coachella Valley Recovery Center. And we're located in the Coachella Valley, just about five minutes, seven minutes from Palm Springs International Airport. And what happened was um, I was a consultant, a financial, well, I, not really a financial consultant, advisor to people for investment purposes. They would trust me to invest. They would hear about the investments that I had available. They would invest their money, companies that were going public, movies that were being made, kind of like an executive producer Got on it. the movie business. So I did that and I raised a lot of capital and put a lot of money together for, for a lot of companies. And I made a really good living. Um, and, um, you know, my wife, Deborah, who is also in the program, Hi, she's Deborah. actually got one day Amazing. longer than me. I love her. Okay. She's <laughs> sober one day longer than okay. I am. Okay. She never lets me forget it. Okay. No. Um, you know, I looked at her and we had a really nice home in the San Fernando Valley and, you know, we were cruising along. She's an esthetician by trade and uh, had a thriving business and uh, she owned a business at salons in Beverly Hills and done really well. So um, I just looked at her. I said, you know, I, I want to help people, man. I said, I'm, t I'm so sick of this and wondering if somebody else is going to make the money I raise, go to work for them and make the money that the people need to make. And if the movie's going to be successful or if mm -hmm. this is going to happen. I have no control over that. And it's okay not to have control, but in this situation, I'd yeah. like to have a little bit of control over that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, being a recovered alcoholic, and what I mean by that is I still, I still have the disease of alcoholism, but I, am not, I do not suffer from it anymore. Right. There's a big difference. Big you difference, know, I'm recovered. Yeah. I've mm -hmm. worked the steps. I have no issues with that. I don't suffer anymore. Um, so I said, let's, 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 Go to the desert and let's open a treatment center. And she's like, are you crazy? And I'm like, okay. and then she started talking to me about it. And yeah. And yeah. So we picked up, uprooted, moved out of here. No house to the Coachella Valley by Palm Spring. No home. We sold our home. We had no house. We had no wow. place to live. We rented an Airbnb uh, for three months and we searched for a property. We finally found a house. We bought the house. We gutted the house. We redid the whole thing to do this treatment center. And um, lo and behold, uh, the beginning of, of, and it took us about a year and a half. Lo and behold, the beginning of November of 2022, we opened our doors finally. Mm -hmm. And Coachella Valley Recovery Center and, 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 you know, and Ignite Recovery were born. Mm -hmm. And Ignite is the corporate entity that owns Coachella Valley Recovery. Um, we we created these companies and we said let's just start building a place for people to come and get recovery and get the 12 steps mm -hmm. get it in a 12 step way mm -hmm. and it was a little scary in the beginning and i'll tell you a quick story we didn't have any clients and i was freaking out i'm like calling everybody i called you i called everybody you know you have any people that need to come in i'll take a scholarship free i don't care i don't care about the money you know, we're an insurance-based uh, private pay facility. Mm -hmm. We're not county funded. Well, we're not in network with anybody right now. We're getting to that point. Um, so I, anybody, I'll take them. For, just get them here. Yeah. And um, Tim Ryan mm -hmm. and Jennifer Jimenez, uh, who are friends of the family, basically friends of the Coachella family. Um, I reached out to Tim and Tim says, hey, man, I know what you're about. Let me put it out there. So he put it out there 20 minutes later, he called me back and he goes, I got a guy in Texas that I met at a convention 
uh, that relapsed and he really wants to get clean again, clean and sober. Will you take him? He has no money. I said, absolutely, I'll take him. He says, really, you're gonna open your business with a zero paying client? And I said, absolutely. He goes, you're amazing. And I said, I'm not amazing. I just wanna do God's work, man. Yeah. I just wanna do the recovery work. I so we that. opened the facility. Mm -hmm. Jeff was supposed to get on a plane and fly out and he was vacillating back and forth. While he was vacillating, because I agreed to do that, I know that God answered my prayer. All of a sudden, I had another guy call, wanted to come in, who was an insurance client. And then I had a guy knock on my door who saw us on Google and said, I want to come in. I don't have any money. I let him come in for free, too. Wow. So the beginning, I had Jeff coming from Texas for nothing. I had this guy at my front door, and I won't say any more names, yeah. coming at my front door <laughs> knocking uh, who, uh, you know, wanted to come in. He didn't have any money. I let him come in and I had staff already. So I said, I'm paying my staff. Why not do what I came to do? Yeah. Fast forward, long story short, what happened is by answering all of those gifts of sobriety and recovery and being able to help people, we're full. We've been full. We're at about an 85% census. We've been at 85 to hundred percent since the day we opened. We continue to help people get sober and stay sober. We, we, we hammer home the 12 step, uh, you know, um, method of recovery. Mm -hmm. That's what we're about. If you want to come into recovery and you don't want the 12 steps, don't come to my facility. Yeah. That's just the bottom line. I mean, mm -hmm. I will send you someplace. Yeah. I have no problem placing you someplace where if it's a full, just a mental health scenario, mm -hmm. I understand that. We have also, in addition to being full ourselves, we've been able to place numerous people that have mm -hmm. called us that we can't take care of. There right. are certain things we can't do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, yeah, we, we're, we're blessed. And our plan is, is to open uh, a woman's facility this year as well. Mm -hmm. We're all men. We're a six bed detox residential, okay. all men. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, master level clinicians. We have a phenomenal uh, program director. Um, we have a great LMFT. We've got some good case managers. We've got a fantastic doctor. Dr. Alejandro Alva is our okay. doctor. Very, very well known. And um, you know, people come into our program and we've got success stories already. We've got one kid that was there and went home and I just talked to his people uh, yesterday and he's working, he's clean still hasn't relapsed, uh, which is a blessing, and you pray for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, and then the gentleman I mentioned that came from Texas mm -hmm. decided that he wanted to live out here, so he's staying, and I just got him placed in uh, Desert Serenity um, Sober Living out, okay. there in the, out there in the Coachella Valley. It's so and, amazing. you know, he is going to come back and head up my alumni department. Wow. So my just, first client, I'm yeah. making, he's going to work for me. And you know what? It just shows you. Well, congratulations, first Thank and you. foremost. Um, and, but it just shows you when, when you're doing it for the right reasons. I mean, you have your values, your morals, your integrity intact. You know what you do. You know who you are. And you know that if you instill that, then the rest is going to work out. You know, and I, I love that you just said... We're a 12-step base. This is what we do. If that's not what you want, don't come here. You know, where most people wouldn't say that, right? And, and you say what the truth is and what you believe in and what you're passionate about. And by doing that, they come. And to everybody out there, I've, I've been to this facility. It is amazing. You can feel the love in there. Um, yeah, that it's a, it's a beautiful family-owned business. You know, you and your wife are just doing such great things and your stories and how it came to be. It just, it just gives me goosebumps because these are the stories people need to hear and these are the kind of places people need to go for treatment. And I would send a loved one there. I would send any friend of mine there. Um, and I'm just so excited for you guys and Thank the future you. and everything that it holds and us working together and also just personally being friends. Um, where can people get a hold of you? How can they reach you? So um, first of all, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> Big old Italian guy's gonna cry. I appreciate that coming from you. You know, your facility um, that I visited, The Edge, is the only place that we know of in this area that we would ever refer people to. Well, thank I you. mean, we're extremely, extremely blessed to have that relationship. Um, you know, and um, 
we're both doing phenomenal work. You know, you do the same thing. You feel the same way. That's why we hit it off as That's friends. Right. That That's why you hit it off with my wife mm -hmm. uh, as friends because we're both about the same thing. At the end of the day, if I can lay my head on the pillow and I know that whoever's walked through my facility has gotten every single thing that they could get out of me, then I'm good. Amen so, to that. Getting, uh, getting a hold of us. Um, Coachella Valley Recovery Center .com. Okay. Uh, and it's spelled all out lowercase. Okay. Uh, you can reach us at 442-888-6484. That's our main number. And 442-888-6482 is our admissions department. Um, we're all family owned and operated. Everybody, it, it's not a big uh, bunch of guys with headsets on and 100 people yet. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows how big we're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, never so big that the client doesn't come first. And that's right. really, really what we're about. We're about the client, not the cash. Mm -hmm. The cash comes. It comes, right. I'm, I'm going to be okay. God's got me wrapped in his arms. I'm going to be okay no matter what. Um, but, yeah, that's how you can get a hold of us. Okay. And we're located in the Coachella Valley. I mean, it's... All right. It's uh, it's a nice facility, and if you if you're out there and you're not looking for treatment, but you want to come and see us, and you're in the treatment business, then get a hold of me. Absolutely, and go visit you guys. We'll walk you through. Yeah, we'll walk you through. Thank you for being you, Jennifer. Thank, thank you. you for everything that you do. God bless you, your amazing wife, your facility, and all the growth um, that's to come because I know it's coming. Um, thank you so much for being here and taking thank your you time for to be a service. Me. Thank you so okay. much. Thank All you right. for what you do. Thank you so much. Okay. okay, you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye.